Welcome back to Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. I am Bill Farmer, and we're going to continue discussing the topic of finite automata and regular expressions. And today we have a couple more background items to look at. The first is modular arithmetic. So there's a function you've probably seen before, which is called the modulo function. It is a function that's abbreviated by MOD, and it takes two positive integers and gives back either zero or a positive integer, in other words, a natural number. And this function is usually written in infix notation. So we have a and we have n, and the value of this is the remainder after dividing a by n. So if, if a is divisible by n, then the remainder will be 0. So this is called the modulo function, and n is called the modulus. Um, now, uh, if n is a positive integer, we say that two integers are congruent modulo n, which we write like this, so a and b are two integers, and n is a modulus. It's a positive integer. We will say that, that a is congruent to b modulo n if n divides the difference of a and b. Another way of saying this, it, the difference of a and b mod n equals 0. In other words, um, n evenly divides the difference of a and b. And so there's two very simple propositions that come from this. a is congruent to b modulo n if and only if a mod n equals b mod n. Another simple proposition is that for all uh, moduli n, the congruence modulo n is an equivalence relation. So it's reflexive, it's symmetric, and it's transitive. OK, so um, we're going to look now at what's called the integers modulo n. So let's say n is a modulus. It's a positive integer. The integers modulo n is, which we represent as z sub n. There's other ways of representing it, but I'm going to represent it as z sub n, blackboard z sub n, it's going to be the set of the first n natural numbers, 0 up to n minus 1. And then we can define various functions on this set, which I'll have, I've, I'll define three of them, the successor function modulo n, the addition function modulo n, and the multiplication function modulo n. So the successor function works like this. If I give it a member of z sub n, let's say a, it will give back a plus 1 modulo n. Because I apply the, the mod function, this, this will guarantee that this number will be in this set. Same way with addition. Um, uh, addition sub n of a and b equals normal addition of a and b mod n. And multiplication is, is just the same way. A di, a multiplication of a and b sub n is equal to normal multiplication mod n. And so modular arithmetic is arithmetic on a set of integers modulo n. Now, the, the key thing to understand here that arithmet, modular arithmetic is really clock arithmetic. So. So let me demonstrate right here. So let's say if you're thinking of a normal clock, you have a circle, and we have 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, really, the, the way we should think of this is instead of 12, we should have 0. And these are the members 
of z12. We have the number 0 up to 11. And now what I showed here, these functions, they, the way they work is they work by going around the clock. So when I count, I would start at 0. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And now we, you would think we'd say 12. But when I get to 12, remember when I'm doing, when I get to 11 plus 1, I get 12. Then I, then I take mod 12. So 12 divided by 12, the remainder is 0. So, so to come back here, I count like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 0. That's the way we count. So how do we add? We add in the, the same way. So let's say I'm adding up uh, 7, and, 7 and 8. So I would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so, so 7 plus 8. Um, 7 plus 8 mod 12. So let me do this again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So um, this will be 15 mod 12. That equals 3, and that's what I got. And I do multiplication the same way. If I was multiplying, let's say, uh, 3 times 4, that's basically adding up uh, 3, 4 times. I go 0. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 3 times 4, I, and I take mod 12, and this is 12, so this is 0. That's what I got. So anyway, arithmetic works like clock arithmetic. We do the normal operations, but we go around and around. And the same thing is true uh, for subtraction. Subtraction would be we we do basic addition in the uh, addition by going backwards by coming backwards. Now there's a theorem I, I want to mention, and um, this is for those of you who are interested in different kinds of algebraic structures. If I take this structure. The integers modulo n with 0, 1, um, addition sub n, multiplication sub n, and subtraction sub n. This is a commutative ring, which, if you don't know what that is, that's not that important. But a ring is an algebraic structure with an addition and multiplication, and it may not have multiplicative a multiplicative inverse operation. But because it's commutative, the, multi the multiplication operation is commutative. And the reason I said n greater than 1 is if n equals 1, if we have this case, that just equals 0. And actually, we do get a ring in that case, except 1, one is also going to be 0. So, so 0 is both the additive and the multiplicative identity. Now, what is very interesting is if n is prime, then this same structure, if n is prime, is also a field. And a field has the property, in addition to the ring properties, it has the property that there are multiplicative inverses. So there is a multiplicative inverse operation. Okay, so now we're going to talk about something else, uh, decision problems. A uh, decision problem is qu quite simply a problem to determine an answer uh, for a given input of z uh, yes or no. Um, so I have here a simple example. Given a formula A of a signature sigma, is A closed? Well, the answer would be yes or no. That's the problem. Yes or no. Is it closed or is it not? 
and we can identify decision problems as a function uh, that maps, in this case, it maps uh, formulas of sigma to uh, yes or no, but it could be just as well to true or false or one or zero, something like that. And many problems can be formulated as decision problems. And a solution of a decision problem is going to be an algorithm that tells us how to take an input and come up with either yes or no as the output. In other words, compute yes or no. And so a solution to a decision problem is a computable function. So decision problems are very important and their solutions are computable functions. And in this topic, we will be talking a great deal later about decision problems. So a decision problem is decidable if there exists a computable function that solves it. And we need to take a, a little uh, looking, we need to look back a little bit to one of the great, uh, com great computer scientists and computer engineers and mathematicians and logicians and philosophers and lawyers. Gottfried Leibniz, someone who uh, was interested in almost everything and came up with many great observations and discoveries. And you probably know him as one of the co-inventors of calculus. Well, one of the things he postulated was a language, a universal language, called, which he called the Characteristica Universalis. One thing you should remember about Leibniz, he pretty much wrote all his, his papers and books in Latin. And this language was one that was meant in which any scientific idea could be expressed in it. That's why it's universal. And he also postulated, he thought of the possibility of a computer, which he called the calculus ratioinator. And this would be a computer that could compute the truth or falsity of statements expressed in the Characteristica Universalis. So Leibniz worked on both of these his whole life. And his, his idea was that we would like to be able to write down statements in the Characteristica Universalis and use our calculus ratiocinator to decide whether those statements are true and false. This was his dream. And he had this dream in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And it wasn't until the early 1900s, in fact, this year, 1936, that anyone could, anyone was able to show that Leibniz's dream was an impossibility. And the reason it was shown in 1936 that Leibniz's dream was an impossibility is because Alonzo Church and Alan Turing independently, actually Church published his paper in 36, Turing in 37, they show that there are undecidable decision problems. There are decision problems for which there are no algorithms to solve them. And this basically shows that Leibniz's grand decision problem, his grand decision problem is given a scientific statement, is the statement true, is undecidable. Because they show that basically sub-problems of this grand problem are undecidable. And two examples of undecidable decision problems are the Entscheidungsproblem, this is which we're going to, I'll talk about this in a moment, and the halting problem. The halting problem is a problem of given a, a um, computer program and input for it, will that computer program halt on that input, yes or no? Uh, the Entscheidung's problem is basically given a formula in first order logic, is that formula valid or not? Yes or no? Now, the interesting thing about decision problems is we can formulate, formalize these things as strings. Um, uh, so we can 
think of the problem, we can reduce the problem to whether a member of a set of strings, uh, whether a string is a member of a particular set of strings. So we have a set of strings, S, and we have a member of and a string. Basically, we have, let's say, a string like this. And here's the question. Is this a member of S? That's the decision problem. And a solution to this will be, as I say here, a function that takes a member x, a member of this set of strings, and gives back yes or no. And it gives back yes or no precisely in the way that if x is a member, it gives back yes, otherwise it gives back no. So automata that we're going to look at, they solve decision problems of this form. So. Uh, so we're going to focus not on just all decision problems. We're going to focus on a very basic decision problem. Is a particular string a member of a certain set of strings? OK, so here's an example with theories. So let t be a theory of f of l. And let sigma, now in this case, sigma is not the signature of t. Sigma is going to be our alphabet. Sigma is going to be the variable symbols the logical constant symbols, the non-logical constant symbols, and the punctuation symbols that are used in T. So throw all of those in sigma, and then we can have strings of these symbols. So the set of all strings is sigma star, and every formula of T is going to be a string over this alphabet. Now there's going to be many strings that are not formulas, but all the formulas are going to be strings over this alphabet. Um, so let S um, be the set of strings that represent formulas A of T such that um, A is a theorem of T, or you can say that A is a logical consequence of the axioms of T. So um, another, another way of saying it, A is valid in T. So, so this problem now, the decision problem of whether a formula is valid in T, this, this problem we can formalize as whether a string is a member of S. And the interesting thing is people say that we people will say that T is decidable if this decision problem is decidable. So some theorems are decidable. Some aren't. A or should, I should say, some theories are decidable, some aren't. A theory is decidable if there is an algorithm that will tell me whether a given formula of that theory is valid in the theory or not. And what Church proved, he proved that the empty theory of FOL, the theory that has no axioms, is undecidable. And Another way of saying this is that um, first our logic is undecided. Okay, so next time we're going to start with the real heart of this topic, deterministic finite automata. See you next time.